Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir and I am an assistant professor at the Jindal Global Law School. Welcome to the UGC's EPG Patshala project, Civil and Political Rights and module number 18, the right to information in India. Perhaps the most significant act of parliament passed in recent times is the Right to Information Act 2005. Following a sustained movement by civil society organizations, primarily the National Campaign for People's Right to Information or the NCPRI, the government of the day decided to empower India's citizens with the right to information. This module will first give the students a brief overview of Supreme Court judgments on the right to information. The module will then focus on the Right to Information Act, the RTI Act 2005 and its working. What are the learning outcomes of this module? Well, the purpose of this module is to first give the students an overview of the constitutionally recognized components of an individual's right to information. It also aims to help the students understand the manner in which the right to information has been codified by the Right to Information Act 2005. To give the students an overview of the Right to Information Act and the manner of its functioning is the primary object of this module. Now let's start with the Supreme Court and what it's had to say on the right to information. The court in many instances has upheld the right to information as an integral part of the proper functioning of a democracy and as a fundamental right under part three of the constitution of India. The right to information is read into article 19.1a of the constitution and it has been broadened to include not only the right to freedom of speech and expression but also the right to access information. In the case of the Secretary Minister of IND versus Cricket Association of Bengal, the Supreme Court summarized the law and the freedom of speech and expression under Article 19.1a as restricted by Article 19.2 and held the freedom of speech and expression includes the right to acquire information and to disseminate. In the state of Uttar Pradesh versus Raj Narayan, the court gave a broad and expansive meaning to the right to information. The court stated, in a government of responsibility like ours, where all the agents of the public must be responsible for their conduct, there can be few secrets. The people of this country have a right to know every public act, everything that is done in a public way by their public functionaries. So right then and there, the Supreme Court says, you cannot have secrecy in a democracy. The people of this country have a right to know every public act, everything that is being done, the reasons for a public act and the manner of functioning of their public authorities and their elected representatives. The reason behind this is very simple. We, the people, pay taxes. We, the people, work and we give them a part of our earnings. We give it to the government of the day. We give it to public bodies. We subsidize them. We give them bungalows. We give them cars. So essentially, they are there to serve us not to serve themselves. And how do we keep a check on them? By having access to information that is compiled, that is held on their functioning. That's what the court said in state of Uttar Pradesh versus Raj Narayan. The court went on and I quote, they are entitled to know the particulars of every public transaction in all its bearing. The right to know, which is derived from the concept of freedom of speech, is not absolute, the court said, but it is a factor which should make one very when secrecy is claimed for transactions which can at any rate have no repercussion on public security. To cover with veil of secrecy the common routine business of the government is not in the interest of the public. Routine business of the government. What does that mean? How much did a, how much did a minister spend traveling abroad? Uh, how much did the president of India, for example, spend on a trip to, say, South America? These are queries that should be answered. These are queries that should be answered because it's, you know, common routine business. Finding out how much a minister spent traveling to, say, a junket somewhere, you know, in Brazil or Argentina does not actually affect national security. You have a right to know what these people are doing with your money, is what the Supreme Court essentially said. And the Supreme Court also said such secrecy can seldom be legitimately desired. It is generally desired for the purpose of parties and politics of personal self-interest or bureaucratic routine. The responsibility of officials to explain and to justify their acts is the chief safeguard against oppression and corruption. It's very simple. It's there on paper. 
everything they've done, everything they've spent, what are the funds gone? Everything is on paper. And when it's on paper, it is a fact. And that is the ultimate safeguard. The right to information actually puts in place. Now, in the case of S.P. Gupta versus Union of India, the court held the concept of an open government is the direct emanation from the right to know which seems to be implicit in the right to free speech and expression guaranteed under Article 19.1a. Not only do you have the right to disseminate, but you also have the right to seek and impart information and receive information. Most importantly, receive it. Therefore, disclosure of information in regard to the functioning of government must be the rule and secrecy and exception justified only where the strictest requirement of public interest so demands. That is a direct quote from the Supreme Court judgment in S.P. Gupta versus Union of India. In the landmark judgment of the People's Union for Civil Liberties, PUCL, versus the Union of India, the court also held that since all fundamental rights under Part 3 are subject to reasonable restrictions, the right to information must also be read in a way to embody the same. Right? Essentially, in the, that case, the Supreme Court said, we cannot give you an absolute right to information. You cannot have the right to know what is India's strategy on combating Pakistan, for example. Right, because that would directly affect national security. What did the foreign ministers of, say, India and China discuss? Right, maybe that should not be disclosed. Some might say it should be disclosed. So it's really a balancing act. Right, the Right to Information Act was enacted with these basic principles in mind. So now let's come to the RTI Act 2005. Perhaps, or in fact, beyond any doubt, the most important act in the 21st century that the Indian Parliament has passed. It was. Uh, passed by Parliament in May 2005, signed by the President of India in June 2005, and the entire Act came into force in October 2005, ushering in a new era of accountability and responsibility in the world's largest democracy. Under the Act, all Indian citizens have a right to ask for information, not only from the central government, but also from public authorities under the jurisdiction of the states. So it's not just the central government, not just the union, right? It's also the state government basically. The RTI Act includes several local level bodies, panchayats, right? The Act covers all public authorities set up by the constitution or statute as well as bodies controlled or substantially financed by the government, right? Bodies substantially financed by the government are non-government organizations which are substantially funded by the government, it includes NGOs, which are substantially funded by the government. Citizens can not only request to inspect or copy information, but the Act also allows them to make an application to inspect public works and take samples. So there is a project going on, let us say. You know, the CWG games in Delhi, the Commonwealth Games. You have the right to actually go there and inspect public works, take samples. What is happening, right? Where is public money being spent on? You're talking about the beautification of Delhi. Where is the beautification? How much is the beautification costing, essentially? The RTI Act gives you that power, right? The key section, right, in the RTI Act is Section 2, subsection F, which defines the right to information. And I quote, the right to access information held by or under the control of any public authority includes the right to, one, inspection of work, documents, or public records, taking notes, extracts, or certified copies of documents or records, Three, taking certified samples of material. Four, obtaining information stored in a computer or in any other device in the form of discs, floppies, tapes, video cassettes, or in any form of electronic mode or through printouts, basically. Right? Now, how does the Act define information? Right? Information under the Act is any material in any form, as wide as it can get. Right? Section 2, F, defines information as any material in any form, including records, documents, memos, emails, opinions, advice, press releases, circulars, orders, logbooks, contracts, reports, papers, samples, models, data held in any electronic form, and information relating to any private body which can be accessed by a public authority under any other law for the time being enforced. So it also includes information relating to a private body, provided that information can be accessed by a public authority, basically, right? So, how do you get this information, right? You have the RTI Act, you have the RTI Act, which defines information, right, as wide as possible. How do you go about getting the information? What is the procedure? Well, 
it's not a cumbersome procedure at all right a rarity in india there is no prescribed format of application for seeking in, uh, information in the rti act the application can be made on plain paper right take a piece of paper take a pen write down the name of the body you are uh, applying to the address your address sign it brief uh, you know request for information done right that's it the information seeker is not required to give reasons even for seeking information i want to know how much was spent on renovating the jawaharlal nehru stadium for the commonwealth games that's it's as simple as that basically right public authorities have to designate some of its officers as public information officers all public authorities bsnl lic you name it right the highways authority of india you name it all these authorities have to have designated public information officers their job is to process a, a right to information requests these pios are responsible to give information to a person who seeks information under the rti act each public authority in turn has a central public information officer a cpi right so a public authority that's as big as say the bhel bharat earth movers the uh, bhel the bharat heavy electronics limited basically right it has several public information officers because it has several departments essentially right or coal india for that matter or sales the steel authority of india right essentially and they have one central pio the cpio who oversees the functioning of all these other officers right now under the right to information act 2005 right to information rules have been drafted and these rules were drafted in 2012 and these rules deal with the procedures a citizen who desires to seek some information from a public authority is required to send along with the application right it can just be on a piece of paper a dd a demand draft or a banker's check right or even a postal order indian postal order of 10 rupees only able to the accounts officer of the public authority as fee prescribed for seeking information in this day and age in india 10 rupees does not amount to much at all basically that 10 rupees needs to be addressed to the accounts officer in the form of a dd banker's check or postal order the applicant may also be required to pay a further fee towards the cost of providing the information details of which shall be intimated right these details shall be intimated to the applicant by the public information officer right so essentially the public authority might say well the information you are asking for thousands and thousands of pages photocopies right we can't just give it to you gratis free right so they might say fine play a reasonable fee cost for providing the information and you have to intimate right the applicant as to the cost of this essentially the right to information rules also deal with the issue of inspection of records for inspection of records the public authority shall charge no fee for the first hour right you go to the place of the public authority go to their office you inspect the records first hour is free every subsequent hour you pay a fee of 5 rupees or a fraction thereof so you inspect the records for an hour and a half you pay 2 rupees 50 paise why because first hour is free right and the second hour we have not taken up the entire hour only half an hour so they charge you 50% of 5 rupees which is 2 rupees 50 paise right now if the applicant belongs to the below poverty line bpl category he is not required to pay any fee so bpl category requirements i think if you earn somewhere in the region of 30 to 50 rupees a day you're considered below poverty line so you can't be expected to pay a big chunk of what you earn on a day to day basis to inspect records right so it's absolutely free if you have a bpl certificate however you should submit proof of this certificate showing that you belong to the bpl category now we come to another important section section 12 of the rti act 2005 what does section 12 do section 12 constitutes a central information commission which is headed by a chief information commissioner or the cic a very very important post in india today and section 15 constitutes state information commissions essentially an applicant whose application has been delayed or rejected by a public authority can appeal to the first appellate uh, appellate authority this first appellate authority is within the same public body so again let's take the example of the steel authority of india limited basically they have pios they have a cpio and above the cpio they have an officer who is designated as the first appellate authority right so information is denied by the cpio you appeal to an officer the same public authority in sale in the steel authority of india who is designated first appellate authority right now 
he rejects the request for information right so if the first appellate authority fails to pass an order on the appeal within the prescribed period also or the appeal appellant is not satisfied with the order of the first appellate authority rejecting the request right the applicant may prefer a second appeal now where does the second appeal go it goes to the information commission right and this appeal must be filed within 90 days from the date on which the decision should have been made by the first appellate, appellate authority or was actually received by the appellant basically so it gives you 90 days right three scenarios you have 90 days either from the day you received the order you have 90 days from the date the order was made or you have 90 days from the date on which the order was supposed to have been made and was not made by the first appellate authority pretty straightforward stuff right here you're looking at a screen grab of the rti application uh, process online simple rti form online you can log on file your request for information any of us can do this as citizens of this country right now let's come to the all important issue of exemptions right the right to information is not absolute as the supreme court has held and this principle has been incorporated now in the right to information act right exemptions under the act are divided into two types first are absolute exemptions right these are exemptions which are not subject to the public interest test doesn't matter whether it's the public interest or not very simple this information will never be disclosed under any circumstances right there's only one section section 9 right which is an absolute exemption we'll come to section 9 shortly right then you have the second category of qualified exemptions as the name suggests right these are exemptions which are subject to the public interest test right a weighing has to be done public interest in favor of disclosure versus public interest uh, for no, uh, non disclosure right all the exemptions under sub under section 8 sub section 1 which we will shortly come to are qualified exemptions right in the case of qualified exemptions the public body the public authority must consider whether there is a greater public interest in disclosing the information or withholding the information straightforward enough right now we come to what is essentially the most important section in the rti the section essentially that threatens in some some cases to take away the very right that is granted by the rti under section 8 sub section 1 information that falls under or relates to the following categories need not be disclosed to the public now let's go through each of them one by one right information the disclosure of which would prejudicially affect the sovereignty and integrity of india the security strategic scientific or economic interests of the state relations with foreign states or lead to an incitement of an offence so there is some information basically that would prejudicially affect the sovereignty and integrity of india right in the government of india has essentially come across some sensitive information and disclosure of this sensitive information would in fact directly impact the sovereignty of india they don't have to disclose it right if it would directly impact the st- security or the strategic interests of india they don't have to disclose it maybe they come across some information right there is some the right now the plight of the rohingya muslims for example in myanmar where the government of india for example has been silent on the issue right so they have some perhaps some documents some discussions have taken place with the government of myanmar for example you cannot force the government right to re- reveal what is the nature of these discussions before between the say the ministry of external affairs or india's foreign secretary with the government of myanmar why because that information relates to the strategic strategic interests of india in the region right myanmar acts as a very you know in myanmar acts as a counter to the power of china right myanmar is a very important state in indo china relations right so the geopolitics of the region basically right uh, and you have information that pertains to this okay you have information obama comes to india on a state visit president barack obama comes to india on a state visit what were the nature of his discussions with prime minister narendra modi say at hyderabad house you cannot disclose the those doc, that documentation because that directly could affect the sovereignty integrity of india the security is security is a strategic and a scientific or economic interests of the state right so isro the indian space research indian space research organization for example you cannot say disclose information on how you're building uh, this missile or the next satellite right uh, disclose information on your mission to the moon 
or a mis mission to Mars, basically, right? Also, you don't have to disclose information that affects relations with foreign states, right? Again, same with Myanmar or Sri Lanka, for that matter, or Bangladesh. What were the discussions on the Tista Water Agreement? that you had with uh, the government of Bangladesh. Don't have to disclose it, right? Also, you don't have to disclose information that will lead to incitement of an offense, for example, right? Now, you also don't have to disclose information which has been expressly forbidden to be published by any court of law or tribunal or the disclosure of which may constitute contempt of court. Court has said this information should not be made public. You have a court order. If you, vi if you violate that order, you will be in contempt of court. Therefore, Section 8 protects you from disclosing information, right, that has been forbidden, right, to be published by any court of law or tribunal in the land, basically, right. You also don't have to disclose information which would cause a breach of privilege of parliament or the state legislature, right, you cannot. So, for example, let us say that, uh, let us take the uh, instance of a comment that has been made on parliament, uh, that has been made on the floor of parliament. A very derogatory comment has been made, let us say, on the floor of parliament. The speaker has said, that information is stricken from the record. That information will not be made public. You are a reporter or something like that in the gallery. Basically, you cannot, you cannot, for example, disclose that information, right? Now, let us say you are a member of the Rajya Sabha Secretariat and you are sitting there and you are essentially observing these proceedings. You make a record of what was said, but the chairman of the Rajya Sabha basically says that no, that will be stricken from the record, right? There is no sort of duty, right, for you as a public body there to disclose that because that would constitute a breach of privilege of parliament, something that is to be stricken from the record, basically. You cannot be compelled to uh, disclose information including commercial confidence, trade secrets or intellectual property, the disclosure of which would harm the competitive position of a third party. What does that mean? It's very simple. Right. Let us say KFC has set up in India and or uh, KFC has set up in India. Right. The government of India asks KFC. Right. If you would like to set up in India. Right. If you would like to pass our regulatory tests and checks and mechanisms. Right. For the Food and Drug Administration. Basically, you have to give us certain sensitive information as to how you make your chicken. Basically, how do you make your chicken? Uh, what are the ingredients that go into it? Or, you know, what do you put in any uh, sort of preservatives, you know, uh, uh, you know, that is harmful, that are harmful, etc. So, as this information does not need to be disclosed because it could constitute a trade secret, right? Disclosing how KFC makes its chicken is at the very core of KFC's business and that's a trade secret, right? And if that information is with a public body, a public authority that comes under the ambit of the RTI Act, you cannot force them to disclose that. Why? Because the disclosure of that would harm the competitive position of KFC, would harm the competitive position of a third party, right? Unless the competent authority is satisfied that larger public interest warrants the disclosure of such information, right? So they say, no, there's a larger public interest. The public needs to know, right? Now, if you look at the situation with Maggie, for example, there's issue the issue of lead in Maggie noodles, right? So maybe Maggie, to have Maggie re-enter the market would say, all right, we will give you guarantees of how we make our noodles how we what we put in them etc etc but that could be a trade secret but the government might say yes it's a trade secret but if there is an application made on the RTI Act we believe that the larger public interest warrants the disclosure of this information because people want to know is it safe to eat Maggie and even though it might harm the competitive position of Maggie so Top Ramen might pick up on some of these trade secrets because they are now in the public domain and, and Top Ramen might use it to better their uh, competitive position in the market essentially right now you also don't have to disclose information available to a person in his fiduciary relationship unless the competent authority is satisfied that the larger public interest warrants the disclosure of such information, right? So let us say that uh, you have a state psychiatrist, right? You have a doctor at the uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences who has received information from somebody in the context uh, who's, let us say, a government employee and you're, been you're a government employee and you've been sent for a psychological evaluation. That information cannot be disclosed because it has been received from that person in a sort of fiduciary relationship that you owe them a duty of care as a doctor, it's privileged information, right? But the competent authority might say, no, the larger public interest warrants the disclosure of such information because perhaps that government employee has gone on to commit an act that has essentially uh, led to, you know, a mass disaster, for example, right? And they say, okay, now well, we have to disclose the fact that this individual was clearly ill, 
right? So the larger public interest might warrant disclosure of such information, even though it was received in a fiduciary relationship, right? Also, the information received in confidence from a foreign government, right, does not have to be disclosed, right? So a foreign government says, okay, we are aware that there has been uh, in the Northeast, for example, we feel that the uh, Rep uh, People's Republic of China has been arming insurgents, right? So this information comes from, let us say, uh, Myanmar, right? You don't have to disclose that because that's information you have received in confidence from Myanmar. And why don't you have to disclose that? Very simple. Myanmar won't tell you this again if you disclose it because it harms their relationship with the People's Republic of China. Right? You also have to don't you don't have to disclose information, the disclosure of which would endanger the life or physical safety of any person or identify the source of information or assistance given in confidence for law enforcement or security purposes. Here we're talking about whistleblowers, right? You have a whistleblower who has essentially come forward to say expose a scam or corruption. You don't have to disclose the details of that person because it would endanger right the safety of that person and it would dissuade people from coming forward as whistleblowers in the future, right? You also don't have to disclose information which would impede the process of investigation or apprehension or prosecution of offenders, right? When the court case is going on, when the mat a court case is going on, the matter is sub judice, but there is matter that you as a public body have with you. Let's say there is a directorate of prosecution, right? Say in the state of Karnataka, the directorate of prosecution over there is cannot be bound to reveal information, right? And under section 8, they are protected because it would impede the process of investigation and prosecution of the offender, right? Cabinet papers, absolute ban on them, right? Records of deliberation, the council of ministers, secretaries and other officers, right? You cannot have cabinet deliberations out in the public domain. Again, it's a matter that could affect the sovereignty and integrity of India, right? Cabinet members must be allowed to speak freely in cabinet meetings at Seven Race Coast Road without fear of this information being you know, leaked, not leaked rather, but disclosed to the public, right? See, at the end of the day, these cabinet ministers are held accountable in parliament, right? They're held accountable through parliament. So there is no need for the Right to Information Act to apply to cabinet papers, right? Also, information protected under the Official Secret Act, uh, British era law, also is also exempt. Official secrets are exempt in cases where public interest, again, there's a public interest disclosure test here. Public interest in disclosure must outweigh the harm to the protected interests, right? So now we've just taken you through section 8. Section 8 are all qualified exemptions, but generally the threshold is always public interest, right? Section 9 is an absolute bar. Under section 9, the public information officer or a state public information officer where may reject a request for information where such a request for providing access would involve an infringement of copyright subsisting in a person other than the state. Take this very UGC uh, Patshala project, right? The lectures that I am recording, the copyright vests in me, but I will be handing over this copyright to the UGC at a future date. Until and unless I hand over my copyright over these lectures to the UGC, which is a part of the uh, HRD ministry, they cannot disclose what I am, they cannot disclose these videos, they cannot disclose the e-text or the PowerPoint slides that are viewing because the copyright subsists in a person other than the state. Yours truly, basically. Right. However, in cases where information which is exempt from disclosure forms a part of a record which does not contain any information which is exempt from disclosure under the Act, such information can be reasonably severed from any part that contains exempt information. The information may be provided after removing the exempt part. So essentially, it's very simple. Right. Our information request is put in and says, I want to know who is recording module uh, 18 of the civil and political rights paper, right? Basically, I want to know who is recording module 18. Please tell me, right? You can take this uh, presentation. You can sever all the parts that are copyrighted. And you can have my name, my qualifications, the name of my university, the name of the reviewer if necessary. That's enough. Because the information, my name is not copyright, right? That information is not exempt from disclosure. What is exempt from disclosure is 
the this slide for example section 9 which is you're looking at is exempt from disclosure so sever all of this sever this part and disclose the name and in fact in a scenario like that all you have all they will have to do is send you the citizen the agreement that you have i have with the ugc to provide this content basically you as a citizen have the right to know because it is taxpayer money right that is being utilized for this ugc project basically in such cases the central public information officer, the CPIO or state public information officer shall give a notice to the applicant informing them that only part of the record requested after severance of the record containing information which is exempt. Right? This is very, uh, very, very common in highly classified documents. Right? It's uh, something known as redaction. You redact right you use a black marker and you redact sensitive information and you supply a photocopy to the applicant and please give him notice is what the act says that you are doing so now let's look at a couple of cases uh, mangalram jat versus uh, banaras hindu university in this case the commission explained its role ambit and scope of exemptions right in the context of the rti act it's a decision of the information commission they said you cannot create new exemptions right you cannot, the commission cannot create new exemptions against the act. The act is exhaustive on exemptions. Under the act, providing information is the rule and denial an exception. Any attempt to constrict or deny information to the sovereign citizen of India without the explicit sanction of the law will be going against rule of law. Right? They also spoke on, uh, they also looked at uh, reasons for denial of request, right? And they took into account the fact that the right to information was read into Article 19 as a fundamental right. Therefore, the commission held that it had no authority to import new exemptions and in the process curtailed the fundamental right to information of the citizens. The Right to Information Act is the final word on exemptions, right? And they says, if you deny information, right, you must give that applicant reasons. They said so in Dhananjay Tripathi versus again BHU, Banaras in the University. The applicant had applied for information relating to the treatment and subsequent death of a student in the university hospital due to the alleged negligence of the doctors attending to him. The appellant, however, was denied the information by the P of the university saying that the information sought could not be provided under Section 8.1G of the RTI Act. They gave no further reason as to why the information could not be provided. The commission held that simply quoting a provision like Section 8 of the Act to deny information is not sufficient. You have to give a justification as to why the information has been denied, how the provisions of Section 8 are applicable. Right? You cannot simply state Section 8. And this amounts to malified denial to the applicant of legitimate information. So, Dhananjay Tripathi essentially said, reasons must be provided and a failure to provide reasons would attract penalties under Section 20 of the RTI Act. Similarly, in the case of GS Gangadharappa, the commission held that denial of information has to be only on the basis of the exemption under Section 8.1. You must carefully explain the reasons of how the exemptions apply. And when a public information officer wish to deny it, he has to explain it, but he cannot simply say subsection 8. That's not adequate, basically, right? Essentially reiterating what was held in Dhananjay Tripathi, right? Now, now we come to third party information. Under the Act, a third party is defined as a person other than the citizen making the request for information and includes a public authority. With regard to disclosure of any information or record or part thereof on a request made under the Act, which relates to information supplied by a third party, the public information officer or state public information officer should, within five days from the receipt of the request, give a written notice to such third party of the request. Right? So, essentially, you let us take this project again. You have information supplied by, say, myself. Right? I am a third party. I have supplied this information to the UGC, which is a public authority, as it's part of the uh, HRD ministry, right? Does the HRD ministry, on a right to information request, have the authority to disclose information that I have provided to them? Well, the Act says that within five days of the receipt of request, give a written notice to me, the third party, of such a request. If the PIO intends to disclose the information, or record or part thereof, the PIO must invite the third party to make a submission in writing or orally regarding whether the information should be disclosed and such submission of the third party shall be kept in view while taking a decision about the disclosure of information. So the third party has a major say. After all, it's the third party's information. The third party is a private citizen, a private actor, right? You can't have information I've supplied to a public authority being disclosed without, you know, taking me into consultation. But remember, it's only consultation. They don't need my concurrence. They don't need my permission or consent. The RTI Act 
clearly does not give the third party an absolute right to reject disclosure of information. I cannot say, no, I reject this, this request. No, I have no power, right, under the Act, except in the case of trade or commercial secrets protected by law. We've already dealt with this. Disclosure may be allowed, right, as long as it does not affect your comp competitive position in the market, as long as it does not you know, is not detrimental to your trade or commercial secrets that are protected, the disclosure may be allowed. By whom? By whom? By the PIO. Basically, if the public interest in disclosure, again, right, outweighs the importance or uh, outweighs in importance any possible harm to injury to the interests of the third party, right? Again, it's a public interest test. Public interest in favor of disclosure, public interest in favor of non-disclosure because it harms the interests of third party right? Again, a balancing test. You're looking here at a photograph uh, of uh, put up by the NCPRI, the National Campaign uh, for the Right to Information, right? And they are talking about attempts here at amending the RTI and they've been resisted. The Basically, the classes that are affected most by the RTI have tried to amend it repeatedly, but have so far been relatively unsuccessful because of, of the vigilance of various civil society organizations. That brings us to the end of this module. The basic object of the Right to Information Act is to empower the citizens, to promote transparency and accountability in the working of the government, to contain corruption and to enhance citizen participation in democratic processes, thereby making our democracy work for the people in a real sense. What the Right to Information Act has essentially done is made each citizen vigilant. It has given each citizen the power to question his government. It is a government, after all, of the people, and it is the people who have to keep that government and those who staff it in check. This module has demonstrated how this objective has to be balanced with the consequences of disclosure of information that might be prejudicial to the national interest or is of a privileged or confidential nature. Although we live in the age of information, right, the RTI Act recognizes that you cannot have an absolute right to information. Some might argue that there should be an absolute right to information. Now, that is another debate, right? But as far as the Right to Information Act is concerned, the general rule is still in favor of disclosure and denial of disclosure is the exemption, right? The right to information this module has demonstrated is by no means absolute. The Central Information Commission has emphatically stated However, that disclosure is the rule, as I said, and denial the exception. And it would be no exaggeration to say that the RTI Act is the most significant legislative instrument in modern democratic India, and some might say one of the most important laws on our statute books.